This is a video essay in about as literal of a sense as I can muster up. Because to be honest, this one wasn't really made for YouTube. I had to do a foundation year at university before going on to the film course, and that foundation year included a course on the history of the United Kingdom from the 1900s through to the present day. And we had to pick one particular subject and basically write an essay on that. And I thought, uh, well, um, A Clockwork Orange was produced in the UK and it caused quite some controversy. I guess I'll do my essay on that. So the title of the essay was, Did A Clockwork Orange Promote Crime? But to make it kind of acceptable for the course, I just put in the United Kingdom on the end of it. <laughs> beat the system, I actually did really well on this. But I figured in wake of all of the controversies surrounding the Joker movie and all the people calling for it to be banned and allegedly people walking out of cinemas because they're just too disturbed, I thought I would do something on a similar topic while we're at it. And I've been wanting to talk about other films outside of the superhero genre for quite some time, so I thought, hey ho, let's let's just let's do something tried and tested, you know? I got decent marks on the essay, so let's see what you guys have to say. This is like the first scripted video I have done in a very, very long time. I think the first scripted video since back when I was doing Gotham videos consistently. I don't know, maybe you think it's a return to form. Okay, let's begin. Throughout the ages, graphic content depicted in film and other media has received scrutiny from members of the general public, and even government professionals, as an act of extreme irresponsibility from the filmmakers and writers involved in the craft. These perspectives dictate that film and other media have a great deal of influence on the actions of the general public, and that to depict graphic scenes of violence, terror, and malevolence renders the product responsible for any crimes committed that might have been inspired by this. The films are often held responsible for the acts of the people who experienced the films. Much like The Exorcist, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange was a film that a vast number of cinema enthusiasts were desperate to have in their own collections throughout the 1980s and 1990s. These two films in particular were subject to extreme popularity during the era of the VHS tape. However, efforts to obtain or rent an official VHS copy of A Clockwork Orange proved fruitless with many, consulting under-the-radar black market piracy industries for low-quality illegal copies. A Clockwork Orange premiered in New York City on the 19th of December 1971 and released in theatres in the United States of America and the United Kingdom on the 13th of January 1972. In wake of a number of films, Soldier Blue, The Devil's Witchfinder General, The Wild Bunch, Straw Dogs, and Performance which proved to be groundbreaking challenges to the official morality of film classification professionals and critics alike. Based on the novel by Anthony Burgess of the same name, Stanley Kubrick's film adaptation of A Clockwork Orange depicts a decline of civilization in a dystopian vision of the future of the United Kingdom with a social narrative on nihilistic violence, social control, and the necessity for evil. The film features Malcolm McDowell as Alex. He and his band of droogs partake in narcotic cocktails and acts of ultraviolence in a flamboyantly stylized take on dystopian England as if it wasn't dystopian already, am I right? The film was pulled from theatres in 1973 with no VHS release for nearly three decades. Three dang decades! However, the story behind A Clockwork Orange's absence of VHS release doesn't play out as one would typically expect, and is certainly a far cry from what happened with The Exorcist, which stood front and centre in the gaze of an official ban. <laughs> Hard luck, Exorcist. Always knew you were a bit weak. The British Broad of Film Classification did not pull the trigger on this curious case. As a matter of fact, Stephen Murphy, secretary of the British Board of Film Classification, praised the film, calling it one of the most brilliant pieces of cinema, not simply of this year, but possibly of this decade. As well as former secretary of the British Board of Film Classification, calling the film perhaps the most brilliant piece of cinematic art I have ever seen. However, it was upon scrutiny and vilification from the press that the film was withdrawn from its distribution, not by the British Board of Film Classification as one would usually expect, but by the film's director, Stanley Kubrick. Now, the reason I keep referring to the BBFC as the British Board of Film Classification is because there was a word count on this essay. You know, you, you gotta take shortcuts sometimes. 
billed as being the adventure of a young man whose principal interests are rape, ultraviolence, and Beethoven, it was obvious that A Clockwork Orange would be the subject of controversy throughout its 61 weeks that it played to the public of the United Kingdom, as well as preoccupying the attention of politicians, the media, the church, the law enforcement, and the youth. Labour MP for Coventry West and co-chairman of the All-Party Film Committee, Maurice Edelman, accumulated 50 MPs and peers to attend a showing of A Clockwork Orange at the Soho Trade Cinema on the 25th of January 1972, and was quoted the following in the press. The film stimulates for two and a half hours an appetite for sadistic violence with the instantaneous communication which the visual arts uniquely offer. I believe that when A Clockwork Orange is generally released, it will lead to a clockwork cult which will magnify teenage violence. As quoted in the Evening News 1972, this contributed to the growing sea of moral panic, which partly stemmed from the liberalization of the arts in the 1960s. The odds began to stack against Stanley Kubrick and A Clockwork Orange when the press reported a state of alleged crimes inspired by A Clockwork Orange and the respective title had become a phrase used for youthful crimes at that time. The first and most notorious crime reported was a case involving a 16-year-old boy named James Palmer who had mercilessly and relentlessly beaten a tramp to death in Oxfordshire. In the words of Edward Laxton who reported in the Daily Mirror, the terrifying violence of this film, A Clockwork Orange, fascinated a quiet boy from grammar school, and it turned him into a brutal murderer. The boy viciously battered to death a harmless old tramp as he acted out in real life a scene straight from the movie, A Clockwork Orange. The tragic outcome of A Clockwork Orange's release was now in the spotlight, which ignited the scrutiny of skeptics toward the film. Various sexual assaults and murders were attributed to the film over the course of its theatrical run in the UK. A 17-year-old girl of Dutch origin was sexually assaulted in Lancashire by multiple men singing, Singing in the Rain. A 16-year-old boy assaulted a younger child while wearing the iconic uniform that Alex DeLarge wore in the film, consisting of one white overalls, a black bowler hat, and combat boots. The judge sentencing the boy referred to these crimes as a horrible trend which has been inspired by this wretched film. Reverend John Lambert commented in the evening news, I am utterly convinced in my own mind and from talking to many young people that this celluloid cesspool has done more damage to young people than just a boy who beat out a meth drinker's brains with a brick. A Clockwork Orange was not without its defenders, though. Author of the original book, Anthony Burgess, commented on the hysteria, saying, The notorious murderer, Haig, who killed and drank their blood, was inspired by the sacrament of the Eucharist. Does this mean we should ban the Bible? The actor Miriam Carlin, who was seen in the film being crushed to her demise by Alex with a large sculpture of the male reproductive organ, publicly defended the film, stating that no normal human being would be influenced by it. Finally, someone that talks some actual sense, right? But in spite of the defense for it, the overwhelming negative publicity towards the film, as well as personal feelings of guilt, led Stanley Kubrick to take responsibility and have the film pulled in 1973 without statement, leading to the myth of an official ban. In March of the year 2000, A Clockwork Orange made its legal return to screens in the UK, which came shortly after the death of Stanley Kubrick. Warner Brothers had applied for a certificate for the film, and thus it was granted a a highly understandable 18 certificate by the BBFC. The film finally made its return to the United Kingdom cinema screens, with debates of the film inciting violence put more or less to rest. At long last, film enthusiasts could view the film in high quality without technical interferences as found in pirated VHS tapes. Today, the film is viewed as a cult classic with an adoring fanbase. Crimes inspired by the film do still occasionally occur, with instances as recent as December 2005, where a gang were found guilty of killing a bar manager with tactics mirroring that of the Droogs, as featured in the film. 
Much like the words of actor Miriam Carlin, today we view film-inspired crimes as the responsibility of the perpetrator and not the film itself, as audiences today are treated with a bit more credibility than they were when the liberation of the arts was still new and scary and a prospect that audiences and figures of authority were still unsure what to think of. Or so I thought as I was writing this essay, and it was before Joker came out, which has clearly proven that wrong. A Clockwork Orange contains ambiguous moral messages about human Humanity, in people like Alex DeLarge who are relentless, animalistic, and act on their every dark instinct. The story shines a very unflattering light upon the idea of conditioning evil out of sick-minded individuals that pose a danger to society in favour of traditional prison sentences. Alex DeLarge is a highly unconventional protagonist for an extremely new concept at the time, and it was at a time when filmmakers were first daring to delve into riskier territory upon the liberation of the arts, and it is understandable that people back then reacted with hysteria towards it. This essay would conclude that A Clockwork Orange did not promote violence in the UK, however it was released at a time when the world simply wasn't ready for it, and while it may have inspired the execution of certain crimes, it certainly was not the cause for them. Because I think ultimately if a person has it in them to commit murder or torturous acts upon another human being, or even so much as an animal, it can only say more about the individual carrying out such sick acts than it does about a film that they watched. Personally, I believe that individuals should be held responsible for their own actions, and that's because I've got common sense. What do you guys think? Comment below and discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below are links to my Patreon and my Discord. This video is brought to you by Zentai Zentai for all your cosplay needs. Link is in the description below and they are very cool and good. Cosplay your favorite characters or send in one of your own designs. Affordable prices and very high quality. Made to order and made to measure. But most of all, made to be heckin' awesome. If you couldn't already tell. Guys, can you believe where we are now and where we started? How long ago it was that chat Channel Pup or Channel Goat even came about. Because it really wasn't that long when you think about it. Can you believe the amount of support I've received from this community, from, from all of you subscribing to the channel and everything? It's, it's unreal. It's a dream come true for me. But behind the YouTubers you watch usually comes a bit of a truth is that they're often dirt poor. Now I've had the good fortune of being able to grow this YouTube channel and hopefully turn it into a career, but I'm gonna need a little bit of help along the way to even the odds to make ends meet so that I can use all of the possible time that I have to make videos for you guys as opposed to doing something mundane for barely enough money to make it worth its while. I've done all that. I've lived that life. The fact is, together we all built Channel Pup. We made it what it is today and I want to keep the ball rolling on that. I don't ever want to stop doing this because this is the most gratifying job I've ever had. And I think the most pleasurable hobby anyone could ever have. I don't take any of the support that I receive from you guys for granted, but if in any way you're wondering if maybe you could do a little more for the channel even, then I want to direct you to the Patreon link in the description below. It would mean the world to me to have your support via Patreon. It can help me to make ends meet, it can help me to better my content, it can help me to have more time to really work on this stuff. But you know what, I'm not just going to take your support and run. No way, Jose. I've, uh, in the Patreon, you can access exclusive videos via the Pups Project Room playlist, where you can see different projects that I've been working on or have worked on that have either not made it to YouTube for general viewing or have been cancelled or, well, you can get a little view of the process that goes behind the Channel Pup videos and productions. As well as that, you tend to get advanced previews of the bigger Channel Pup projects, our tentpole event projects. If you've seen Marvelous Tales of Spider-Man, you'll be aware that that was released on the Patreon first, and uh, 20 days later approximately was released for general viewing on YouTube. That's not the only time I'm gonna do this. But you know what? If you can't do the Patreon, or are just not interested in doing the Patreon, I fully understand. Like, it, it's, it's still a big ask in my opinion. And what counts most is your support. So, as always, thank you so much guys, I've been Channel Pup, and I will think of a better catchphrase next time. Now please leave!